Hello and welcome to the West Asia Post with me, Radhi Francis. This is our weekly show where we bring you all the latest updates from the world's most volatile region. There has been a massive explosion at one of West Asia's biggest ports. The explosion aboard a container ship sparked a fire at Dubai's Jabal Ali port. No casualties have been reported so far, but the incident sent tremors through the city of Dubai. This comes amid an emerging rivalry between two traditional Gulf allies. Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates are fighting. And this time it is over oil. The United Arab Emirates refused to agree to a Saudi-backed plan to boost oil output. The unusually public spat over the future of oil output has raised questions about the future of OPEC. Oil prices remain in limbo amid oil cartel standoff and the deadlock signals at the growing competition in the Gulf. A massive explosion that shook Dubai. A fireball at one of the world's busiest ports. Smoke billowing from the container of a ship and a blast powerful enough to be seen from space. What looks like a massive orange light against the night sky was a fiery explosion that erupted on a container ship. It was anchored in Dubai at the Jabal Ali port, one of the world's largest and busiest ports. Jabal Ali port is Dubai's gateway to the world. 8,000 companies are based at the Jabal Ali Free Zone. It contributed to 23% of Dubai's GDP last year and is West Asia's largest trade zone. So this bizarre explosion has raised some questions. A probe has been ordered into the explosion. Fingers are already being pointed at countries. But the timing of the explosion is a suspicious one. It comes as Saudi Arabia and the UAE are having a rare public spat over oil output. The UAE has rejected a Saudi-led deal at the OPEC meet, the latest sign of friction between the Gulf neighbors. Riyadh wants to raise production beyond the set limit. UAE rejected this proposal, calling it unfair. The Emirates instead demanded an increase in its own production. A spat could have been solved if one royal family dialed the other. But instead, it escalated at a recent meeting of the oil cartel. The recent spike in oil prices is definitely a reaction or a response to OPEC Plus's failure to reach an agreement to increase production for August. The market was absolutely expecting uh, some kind of increase, at least in the 400,000 barrel per day range. And the fact that OPEC has not delivered that, at least not yet, is definitely causing a lot of volatility in the market and uh, price increases. Discussions have been abandoned for now. A new meeting date is yet to be arranged. But the infighting has sent oil prices soaring, with the market in limbo over the standoff. This is not the first dispute in OPEC's history. Since 1960, the cartel has seen a lot of drama. But it is still too early to tell whether this one could escalate into a conflict or turn bitter and destructive like the recent price war. Big efforts were made over the past 14 months that provided fantastic results. And it would be a shame not to maintain those achievements. Some compromise and some rationality is what will save us. Many even say that the fight was inevitable. UAE has been pushing to modernize its economy. Eventually, these aspirations were bound to clash with its most powerful neighbor, Saudi Arabia. Both countries are vying for a position of power as they seek to diversify their economy away from oil. It is a more competitive landscape across the Gulf. For many, the spot signals a new power shift. The Emirates is trying to step out of Riyadh's shadow. 
and new investments are giving it a financial muscle. But UAE's new ambition is not sitting well with Saudi, who has been the de facto leader of the OPEC for a long time. Oil is just one of the many areas they disagree on, like the normalization deals with Israel. While UAE and Israel normalized ties brokered by the U.S. in the historic Abraham Accords during September last year, Saudi Arabia has not followed its neighbor down that path. It still remains wary of any normalization deal, echoing the traditional call for a two-state solution in West Asia. It is unlikely that this path will escalate. The two countries are traditional allies. They have a common enemy in Iran, and they have common interests in the region. Their de facto leaders are even known to be good friends. But as they chart a new post-oil future, points of friction are growing every day. They often find themselves in disagreement, but this time, their differences have global consequences. West Asia Bureau, Weon, World is One. Prime Minister Hassan Diab had a grim warning for Lebanon. The country, he said, was days away from social explosion. Now, the World Bank has called Lebanon's crisis one of the worst depressions in modern history. The currency has lost more than 90% of its value, and more than half of the population currently lives in poverty. Here's a look at the crisis from the heart of Lebanon. Lebanon is a few days away from a social explosion. Lebanese are facing this dark fate alone. Crushed under a mountain of debt, decades of corruption and scandals, the demand for a new government and a financial meltdown like no other. Lebanon is facing its worst crisis since the Civil War, and there seems to be no end in sight. It is one of the worst depressions of modern history. Lebanon's currency has lost 90% of its value, and thousands of people are living in poverty. As politicians struggle to form a government, Hassan Diab appealed to the international community, calling for assistance to prevent the demise of the nation. Diab's plea came as he spoke to diplomats in Lebanon where politicians fail to agree on forming a new government, nearly a year after the cabinet resigned. The formation of a government has been long overdue, and the Lebanese have waited and carried the burden of this long wait, but their patience has started to run out with the crises and sufferings building up. The idea of linking Lebanon's assistance to the formation of a new government has become a threat to the lives of the Lebanese and to the Lebanese entity. Lebanon's crisis has unfolded since late 2019, spiraling out of control in this country of over 6 million. A foreign currency shortage has crippled the import-dependent nation, leaving residents struggling to find fuel, medicines and basic supplies. Daily power outages last for hours, threatening hospitals and food stores, and leaving entire neighborhoods in darkness. Schools are finding it difficult to operate, with more and more teachers leaving the country. Power cuts make it impossible to survive without generators. And shortage of basic materials are threatening schools. Lebanon's educational sector was once prized. It was a regional leader in the sector in West Asia, ranked 10th globally by the WEF's Global Competitiveness Report. But when the crisis erupted, it took the education sector by surprise. 
This year, a year and a half after the crisis erupted, what we are witnessing now is that another 30% of teachers are leaving and quitting. So the qualified teachers left last year. They were fired. And this year, those who have a bit of experience and have the opportunities are taking them. We are in a real crisis now. But it's not only the education sector that is affected. The crisis has taken a toll on its tourism. It has gutted the hospitality sector of Lebanon, known for its beaches, mountain resorts and good food. Hundreds of businesses have been forced to close. But with their dollars trapped in the bank, many Lebanese are turning toward domestic tourism. Currently, most hotel reservations are from Lebanese expats, with resorts in Batroun and Biblos regularly packed. In Batroun you can find hotels, restaurants, the sea. The sea is famous. Reservations? Yes, for sure, some people come from abroad, but the majority are Lebanese expats. Lebanon's crisis has also sparked a hunt for alternatives. Many in the country are adopting veganism as they can no longer afford meat or chicken. From rags to baby diapers, many are scrambling to secure an alternative to sanitary pads, which have grown too expensive in light of its worst financial crisis. I mean, it used to be nothing. We didn't think about it. But now they are expensive. I prefer to get something for my children or to spend the money on food for my children instead of spending the same amount on sanitary pads. Many are currently depending on aid to survive. But the state is fast running out of cash. And subsidies are likely to be trimmed with more families struggling to meet basic needs. It looks like Lebanon is staring at a catastrophe in the coming days. West Asia Bureau, we own. World is one. Like always, we will continue to bring you all the latest updates from the heart of the conflict. Don't go anywhere, we have a lot more lined up for today. But first, as usual, let's take a look at what else is making the headlines across West Asia. The Israeli army blew up the house of a jailed Palestinian who killed an Israeli teen in a drive-by shooting in May. Flames and smoke emerged from the house of Muntasir al-Shalabi after the army blew it up. Iran is at risk of a fifth COVID-19 wave as the Delta variant spreads across the country. Tehran is speeding up its vaccination drive to inoculate the adult population with its own homegrown COVID-19 vaccine. In an effort to roll up the vaccination rollout, Supreme Leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei also received his first dose. Ahmed Jibril, who founded the Popular Front for the Liberation of Palestine, passed away at the age of 83. In its early years, the group carried out dozens of attacks in West Asia and Europe, even using suicide squads. He was later at odds with late Palestinian leader Yasser Arafat over the peace accords with Israel. Former Labour Party chief Isaac Herzog was sworn in as Israel's president. Herzog pledged to use the largely ceremonial role to try to heal deep divisions within Israeli society. He also vowed to fight anti-Semitism, calling for peace between Israel and its neighbors. There has been a major spike in attacks on U.S. military bases in Iraq, a day after 14 rockets were fired at an Iraqi airbase hosting American troops in Anbar. Three rockets landed near the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Iraq's government has called it a terrorist attack. Hundreds of women protest against so-called honor killings in northeast Syria after the latest murders of young women by relatives in the Kurdish-run region. The demonstrators marched down a street in the city of Hasake, some wearing a white t-shirt marked No to Violence in red letters. 
countries across the world are dealing with soaring temperatures. But in Iran and Iraq, heat waves are coupled with power cuts. People are left without any power at temperatures over 45 degrees Celsius. And more and more citizens are taking to the streets. West Asia is experiencing a heat wave. Temperatures exceed 50 degrees Celsius in several parts of the region. But in Iran and Iraq, they are coupled with power cuts and a lack of water. Baghdad residents are no stranger to power cuts. Power from Iraq's main grid suffers year-round, but the shortages worsen during the summer months. Many Iraqis currently spend over $50 per month to tap into generators to extend their power. Billions of U.S. dollars have been spent trying to fix the power grid. But Iraqis have still been depending on local generators. Most of them supply electricity during outages, leaving a mass of cables and wires crisscrossing streets. In 2021, there's no electricity in Iraq, while the temperatures are reaching 50 degrees, and many children and elderly have already died from the heat. We do not have electricity, and we hear that sometimes it's because of certain problems in the system, and other times due to a technical glitch. Due to the power outages this time, not a single watt of energy is being delivered to houses. Refrigerators, air conditioners and fans sit out of service. As residents spray themselves with water to cool down, others are doing anything they can to stay cool. Like taking refuge in the country's water parks. They spend several hours there, cooling down and enjoying with others. The temperatures are very high and there is no electricity. It almost doesn't exist as you know. We came to the pool to rest and spend time because of the current situation is not comfortable, especially here and now. So we come to spend a few hours, then we go back home. Others are taking to the streets of Baghdad, protesting against the continuous power cuts. Many blame the political class ruling Iraq. Iraq's energy minister even resigned as the crisis shows no sign of ending this summer. In neighboring Iran, the picture is the same. Soaring high temperatures, no power in the country's houses, and people out on the streets, even calling for the death of the supreme leader. Protests broke out in several cities in Iran as people got tired of repeated power outages. Chants were heard across the country from neighborhoods and high-rises left without power. The situation got so bad in the country that even President Hassan Rouhani had to apologize. While he did not blame the energy ministry, Rouhani called for finding a swift solution. For Iraq and Iran, it is the same story every summer. But this time, patience is running out. Citizens battered by the pandemic are being further crippled by power cuts. Voices against the establishment are growing louder, with every hour without electricity in Iran and Iraq. West Asia Bureau, we are World is One. We talked about power cuts in Iran and Iraq, but in Syria, citizens have found a more sustainable resource, solar power. Solar panels are now powering homes, schools and hospitals in several parts of the country, with lives no longer grinding to a halt due to lack of power. Let's take a look. In the rebel-held northwest of Syria, huge solar panels poke out of fields. After a decade of war and destroyed infrastructure, many have now switched to renewable energy. We decided to use solar energy. It makes our work a lot easier. The panels don't break down or need repairs, and it's a good source of energy when it comes to farming. More than three million people live in the Idlib region, much of which is controlled by the rebel forces. Across Syria, at least 90% lack a stable power supply. 
In rebel areas, there is little hope of state-provided electricity. Instead, the dark blue silicon panels have become common. They are installed on roofs, sometimes in hospitals, or between tents in massive displacement camps. Here, once smoky diesel generators used to power many homes. But with regular fuel shortages sending prices soaring, solar panels are viewed as a cheaper alternative. They are also more efficient and reliable. In Mustafa's plot, panels are hooked to rotating metal plates. They often turn to follow the movement of the sun. They are among 200 solar panels purchased two years ago, bought by an agricultural cooperative of nearly 20 farmers. We have around 200 solar panels, which cost us about $4,000, between the frames and the solar panels. We were a group of farmers, we all pitched in together. Syria's electricity production was slashed by at least half during the conflict. But as fighting calmed, renewable energy sources have increased. In many of its regime-controlled areas, solar panels provide power for both homes and public institutions. As for those under rebel control, 8% used solar as the main source of power in their homes. The usage of solar power in homes is higher than that among farmers because life cannot go on at home without electricity. In his small apartment, Zakaria Sino turns on a ceiling fan. He then blasts revolutionary anthems to show off the power of his solar setup. Like so many of his neighbors, he has installed three panels on his roof. This is enough to power the fridge, washing machine and lighting. It's difficult for people to continue using diesel and generators. The best and the most cost-effective thing is solar panels. You buy one for a flat fee of about $500, and then every two years you change the batteries. As Assad pledges to rebuild the country, Syria is slowly turning to renewable resources. Earlier, fuel shortages here meant grinding to a halt. But now, solar power in Syria keeps things running. West Asia Bureau, we on. World is one. Qualifying for the Tokyo Olympics is a dream come true for Farzane Fasihi. When she first got the news, she could not believe it. Fasihi, who is often named the Wind Girl, is the ninth Iranian female athlete to qualify, signaling a change in how Tehran perceives women in sports. We tell you more. Farzane Fasihi is often dubbed the wind girl. The Iranian sprinter is among the world's 50 fastest women. But competing for the Tokyo Olympics is a dream come true for Fasihi. I was shocked. The feeling is indescribable. And I truly wish every girl who's trying for this to be able to experience this feeling one day. My family all had tears of joy. The day I got the news, I was at my parents' house with my husband. They all cried with me. She is the first Iranian woman who took part at the World Athletics Indoor Championships. Since then, Fasihi has not stopped. The 28-year-old qualified under the universality quota. It allows one female and male participant each from a number of countries to take part in the Olympics. <laughs> this is provided no other athlete from the same gender has met the qualification criteria for the competition. As an Iranian woman, I want to perform well at my own level. I do not mean to say our level is low. No. To have reached this point means that our level is very high. But my goal is to break Iran's record once again and to achieve a better position, at least to go one step further than the preliminary stage. Fasihi is the ninth Iranian female athlete to qualify. Running is an outlet for the 28-year-old. She was born over a decade after the 1979 revolution, when newly introduced modesty laws made public sporting activity increasingly difficult for millions of women in the country. 
Women's sport has progressed a lot, especially within the past years. A lot of viewpoints on it have turned positive. This is a turning point, in my opinion, now that women are seen and people are investing in them and they are finding sponsors. It is a very important point. For Fasihi, it has been a lifetime of overcoming obstacles. At first, her aim was to secure a place at the Games. Now, her focus remains on getting a medal. But for the wind girl, nothing seems impossible. West Asia Bureau, we on World is One. That's all we have for you on this episode of the West Asia Post. I will see you next week with a brand new lineup, bringing you more stories from the world's most volatile region. Until then, stay home and stay safe. I am Redi Francis, and you're watching We On. World is one.